Hey, y'all. It's another Codex Cantina. Everyone who reads it must converse team up with the Buddhist philosophy of assimilation. This is how uh, Buddhism propagated through Japan. It's a very scholarly work and very cool. Let's talk about it and kick around some ideas for content. You guys can help me out in the comments. Let's do it. Hey y'all, Noah, everyone who reads and must converse is the channel. Thanks for coming back by. And today, I just kind of want to throw out a couple ideas and see what maybe uh, you guys would rather see. Maybe I'll do, you know, multiple of these ideas as videos. There is some really, really cool stuff in this book, The Buddhist Philosophy of Assimilation. This is a scholarly, scholarly work put out by Sophia University in Tokyo. So, love that, right? The Honji Suijaku Theory. So, Honji Suijaku, I probably am mispronouncing that, but is a, th is, is a kind of thing in, in Japanese theory. I'll, I'll give it to you right here. You find Honji is true nature, and suijaku means trace manifestation. So it's kind of calling to mind the inner outer duality of things, uh, the world of appearances and then the world of the, the real, right? And we can't see the real essence of something. Um, it is actually an amalgamation of everything, right? Um, in Buddhist theory, it's that kind of thing, this kind of diamond sutra something is not what it is therefore it can be truly what it is things like that <laughs> so japanese culture seems to have this kind of theory where it does assimilate ideas and processes and how they might be um, illustrated into its own thought and belief sets very easily as long as it resonates right if it's true then there's no block there's a lot of times when we come up against ideas in especially in our culture in western culture where it doesn't matter how true or something uh, true or not something might be you'll have an instant reaction to deny it or say no right when this kind of thing is more what is inside you and how you relate to your own truth than anything else. If you can't uh, loosen up in a way enough to postulate something or even just to hear a viewpoint that might or might not be at odds with it but is just different and you don't even know how it's different or how it might be at odds, whatever, but just reject it based on it's not validating your own internal beliefs. Well, then, you know, you're, you're blocking truth in that kind of way. And Japanese culture seemed to have this kind of open assimilation of ability and an, an, able to happen and able to happen just as a way that the culture functions. Truly, you know, Japanese being a small island country like that was always getting influences from other cultures and those around. And it says in the in the first chapter there illustrates that Je Japan actually is a storehouse for relics and 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 beautiful historical things that have been actually lost in their native countries. Because Japan, Japan was in this unique place to gather and, and they respect and hold things like that very highly, right? So one of the ideas that I have for this kind of discussion, you tell me if you uh, think this would be interesting, BookTube, is to look at the Buddhist philosophy of assimilation, what is put forth here, and put it up against what I know of a Buddhist sutra called the sutra of golden light 
The Sutra of Golden Light I've touched on in my Buddhism from a Western Perspectives playlist. I did it in the context of confession. So the video I have is a video on confession. But the Sutra of Golden Light is about more than just confession. Confession is a is a kind of a nexus around which all the other parts of this sutra revolve. But ultimately, in the later part of the sutra, maybe the last half of the sutra of Golden Light, we have personages, gods and goddesses from India that stand up and proclaim their devotion to Buddha, to Buddhism, to the Buddha himself there in the sutra, but also to Buddhism. And these are the gods of culture, the goddess of education, the god of goddess of commerce and um, government. These kind of powers are, are the ones that are called out that actually embrace Buddhism. So in the sutra of golden light, we see Indian culture being assimilated or Buddhism being assimilated into Indian culture. But also, you know, Buddhism grew out of Indian culture. There was no separation of that. So I think it would be a, an interesting exploration to look at that and then put that up against Japanese uh, assimilation of Buddhism, how that happened, similarities, differences, what have you, right? Y'all let me know if that's interesting to you. That's uh, the first idea that I had. The second one is there is a chapter here. I was just, you know, I, I love looking at the table of contents of books. You find a lot. You find out a lot about it by reading the table of contents. Chapter three, the Buddhist assimilation in China, which happened before Japan, of course, right? On the mainland there. There is a chapter called The Transformation of Avalokiteshvara. So, the transformation of Avalokiteshvara in China. Avalokiteshvara becomes Kuan Yin. Kuan Yin may be very um, familiar to some. Kuan Yin is an extremely popular bodhisattva, not only through song and dance and um, art, but in sutras and in chanting and in and all Buddhist practice. Kuan Yin, Avalokiteshvara, is a bodhisattva of compassion, one of the highest and most essential powers in Buddhism that you deal with your outer world, any anything that you're, how you deal with is, is in compassion and in love. And what a tall order, right? But that's why Kuan Yin Avalokiteshvara is the thousand armed Buddha and has faces looking in all directions, he ears in all directions, eyes in all directions to be mindful of all of this and to also have a hand to give out a hand in help or to give something um, in all directions for any being. It's uh, ridiculous. But the interesting thing is that Avalokiteshvara is the Tibetan name for this uh, bodhisattva, and that is a male figure. And Kuan Yin, the bodhisattva in China, and all of, indeed, all of Asia, Southern Asia, and all the way through Japan, it's Kuan Yin, and Kuan Yin is a female uh, bodhisattva. So, what caused... Uh, the transformation of this bodhisattva. True, Avalokiteshvara is a transforming Buddha. A, a bodhisattva that transforms can appear in any form uh, that will help move the practitioner or the person that is being helped to enlightenment, whatever form that that bodhisattva would want to take, right? So there is no limit. There was never any limit to Avalokiteshvara being only this or only that. But in the great scheme, 
like even just talking about it, Avalokiteshvara was always, you know, referred to as a male, at least in that oh, pure form. In the Lotus Sutra, the White Lotus Sutra, there's a, an entire chapter devoted to Avalokiteshvara. And later in East Asian uh, Buddhism, whether that be in China or Southern Asia or in Japan, it is Kuan Yin. We can understand a change of name. It's an, a different language and a different culture. But from then on, that Buddha, that Bodhisattva, is a female every time, all the way. So it's just very, very interesting to me why and to see um, some content in this book, very scholarly content, uh, talking about just that. I can't wait to explore that and bring some other sutras, the White Lotus Sutra especially, to bear on that because that is the first uh, time in Buddhist sutras, Mahayana sutras, that Avalokiteshvara is dealt, is treated in a full uh, portion, right? So I hope this was interesting for you guys. Y'all let me know. I just, it's just a short one, just throwing out a couple ideas there. And we're going to keep with the buddy read. It's going to be awesome. Leave me a comment down below either way. Uh, and even if you don't think either of them are interesting, right? <laughs> Catch on the next one, booktube. Bye-bye.